In today's episode, we are going over surgical rehab considerations for femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. We're going to be breaking down cam reduction with labral repair. Let's do it. First and foremost, thank you. Thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. I am Dan Pope. I'm a physical therapist. I am a personal trainer. I'm a meathead. I love all things fitness. This is the Fitness Pain-Free Show, where we help coaches and physical therapists like you get your patients out of pain and back in the gym. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that like button. Give me a comment and subscribe. It helps tremendously with that algorithm. If you're listening to the podcast version, please consider leaving a positive review. Again, it helps me out tremendously. If you want to help me out even more, please consider subscribing to Fitness Pain-Free Insiders. It's a comprehensive educational resource and toolkit for the fitness and rehab professional. Think Netflix, but for trainers and physical therapists. It is premium content from yours truly. It's all from me. And it's very similar content to what you'll see in this podcast, but it's much more in-depth. I've been updating this monthly for five or six years or so. And we have over 100 webinars, ebooks, and complete guides. You have access to a private Facebook group. Any questions you have, I can answer them. You can also decide upcoming podcast topics. You get started for just $1 afterwards, just $12.99 a month. It's very cheap, and you can cancel at any time. If you want to get started on this, head to fitnesspainfree.com, click on the programs link, and click on Fitness Pain Free Insiders Online Library. I'll also leave a link in the show notes. So on to today's topic. What is the surgery for femoral acetabular impingement syndrome? So when you have FAI, for short, femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, generally speaking, you have a little extra bony growth, whether that's on the femoral head, a cam deformity, or a pincer deformity, which is going to be extra bone on the acetabulum or the socket of the ball and socket. Sometimes you'll have a labral tear that goes along with these things. And when you have surgery, what they're trying to do is to repair the labrum. The large majority of these tears are going to occur in the antero superior portion of the joint. And what that means is that they're going to repair the front top portion of the labrum because that's where damage usually occurs. They can either do a debridement. So debridement is just cleaning up the labral tear. And this usually occurs for two very different types of labral pathology. So if there's a very small amount of damage, uh, generally, you can debride that area, or it's a complex tear, meaning that you can't repair it. Usually, these are more associated with wear and tear. They can't be repaired. So what they'll do is they'll just debride that area, okay? The other thing they can do with the labrum if it's torn is they can repair it, right? They use sutures and anchors, and they put the labrum back together. If the tear is too big to the point where they can't repair it, they can often reconstruct it. So they'll take an allograft, so they'll take a cadaver graft or they'll use an autograft, and that could be from your own IT band or potentially from your hamstring. More commonly, I tend to see cadaver grafts myself, but that's going to be um, changing based on your region and the surgeon and their preference. So what are the surgical goals behind repairing the labrum within the hip? So for one, within the hip, you have the labrum, which goes around the ball and socket joint, and it creates a vacuum seal, and it contains fluid, right? So basically this vacuum seal with fluid on the inside creates some shock absorption so that when you're running, walking, jumping, lifting weights, whatever it is, you're basically walking on water, right? You've got some fluid uh, between the ball and socket joint, and that helps with some of the shock absorption, okay? This vacuum seal created by the labrum also enhances stability. So there's not going to be as much movement within the joint if the labrum is going to be intact. And the idea is that if you start to have a tear in the labrum, you lose this vacuum seal, there's now less stability, and there's more wear and tear over the course of time. And there's a bit of, of research that's going to show a correlation between cam deformities as well as labral tears and long-term hip arthritis uh, risk increasing, right? Uh, do keep in mind that that's going to be a high relative risk but a very low absolute risk, right? So it's not like you have a labral tear, you're destined for hip surgery in the future, but it is going to increase your risk, right? The other reason why you would do surgery repair of the labrum is because you have pain and you potentially can't play your sport or do your given activities, and you want some sort of intervention that allows you to get it back to that over the course of time, right? So we get the surgery, A, because we want to try to increase the long-term health of the hip and decrease pain, and hopefully get back to whatever sport or activity we can't because we have an injury at the time, right? 
The second part of this surgery is going to be some sort of osteotomy, okay? And this can be on the acetabulum or the socket, right? And this is for pincer deformities, or it can be on the ball portion or the femoral neck, right? Where you have what's called a cam deformity, right? Uh, and I apologize if you're listening to this on the podcast version. I would recommend that you head over to YouTube or watch the uh, video podcast up on Spotify to check this out. Because I have some great images here that kind of talk about the surgery and how it's done, right? Because it's very easy to tell what's going on if you can visualize it and see it. Most of these images coming up are from Chicago Sports Doc on Instagram. Highly recommend you check out his channel. He posts a lot of great images and videos like this. So you can tell what's going on within these surgeries. So for a lot of folks that are getting surgery for FAI, they have a cam deformity, which is going to be extra bone on the femoral neck, right? And you can see on this image on the left, there's extra bone on the femoral neck. I've got a big red arrow. You can see that cam deformity and it is bumping up against the acetabulum. I believe they're bringing this hip into flexion and internal rotation. It's a little tough to see. It's a cross section of the cadaver right? You can very clearly see you've got contact between that cam deformity as well as the acetabulum. And the idea is that over the course of time, that can push the labrum off. It can cause labral tearing, right? Now, the image on the right is after the cam has been shaved down, right? And you have the same degree of hip flexion and internal rotation. And as you can see in the image, there's no contact anymore between the ball and the socket. So getting the surgery does two things. One, we're going to repair the labrum, we're going to restore that vacuum fluid seal. We also want to try to reduce more compression and stress in the future by getting rid of the cam deformity that can cause this problem over the course of time. On this slide, I have another really cool image that I got from one of my patients. So during surgery and before surgery and all throughout surgery, really, uh, they're taking images to see how much of the bone they've taken away so far and whether or not they need to take off more, right? So this image is on the left. You can see it's a ball and socket joint. So it's a femur inside of an acetabulum. And if you see that red line, it points right to that cam deformity, the extra bone. Okay. On the right side, this is after the surgery. And you can see pretty clearly, they kind of scoop the chunk of that bone out. They reduce that cam deformity. Okay. So from another angle, you can kind of see the goals of the surgery. And lastly, we have one more image. On the left, you can see a femoral head and you can see all of the extra bone growth around the femoral neck, okay? On the image to the right, you'll see that femoral head that's been shaved down. So they've reduced the cam deformity, okay? So now you can see what they're doing to the femoral head. And the idea is that you reshape the femoral head so it doesn't create as much compression in the top in front of the hip joint and reduces future labral pathology and irritation. Okay. That's why we're doing the surgery. In other folks, we're not dealing with that cam morphology or we're dealing with cam morphology along with some sort of acetabular morphology, which is known as a pincer deformity. And what that means is that it's not extra bone on the ball or the femoral neck, the ball and socket joint, it's extra bone or of over coverage of the acetabulum and you can undergo surgery to reduce the pincer deformity as well. And I've got a really nice set of images from Chicago sports doc that goes through this surgical process on a cadaver hip joint. So what you'll see on the far left is there's a tool that the surgeon is using to start trimming some of the bone away from the socket. And what you'll notice is that they don't attack the joint from the inside. They're actually going slightly above that. And the idea is that you don't want to damage any of the cartilage within the joint. So what they do is they trim away some of that deformity, that pincer deformity morphology, right? And then after they trim away that morphology, they will take a stitch, right? And they will take that over coverage and kind of uh, attach it to the bone higher up. So we're reducing some of that over coverage. We're reducing some of that compression between the ball and the socket. Okay. So the surgery can either be for the cam morphology or the pincer morphology, or sometimes both. And just to recap, the idea behind doing some sort of modification to the bone is that you want to reduce compression between the femur and the acetabulum, right? We're also looking to reduce pain, return to sport and function, and hopefully to reduce future osteoarthritis. There is research to show that cam deformities are going to increase your risk of osteoarthritis over the course of time, okay? Increase your risk of total hip arthritis,
increase your risk of total hip arthroplasty. And keep in mind that this relative risk is quite high, right? But the absolute risk is low. So just because you have a cam morphology doesn't mean you're destined for hip surgery, but it does increase your risk. And a lot of folks have it and don't end up with a hip replacement over the course of life. Okay. So when is surgery appropriate for femoral acid tabular impingement syndrome, right? So first and foremost, if you're not making progress with conservative management, which is usually some sort of physical therapy and sometimes an injection, okay, and also activity modification. So staying away from things that aggravate this. The second piece is you need to have some sort of labral pathology or labral uh, detachment, okay? Uh, the best type of labral damage to have is generally a mid-substance tear. So the type of tear actually does matter. And lastly, you don't need this, but it's present in the large majority of the surgeries that I see is one of those cam or pincer morphologies. Okay. So if you have that morphology, just a little bit more likely probably to have labral pathology over the course of time, they want to take that down to see if they can reduce future um, injury in the, to the labrum, uh, as you return back to your activities. So when is surgery not appropriate for femoral acid tabular impingement syndrome? So the first one is going to be, excuse me, to be severe osteoarthritis. Okay. And if you start looking through our literature, uh, the best predictor of folks that do poorly with hip uh, scope surgery is going to be decreased joint space, right? So if you have less than two millimeters of joint space, your increase, uh, ri your risk of getting total hip arthroplasty increases in the future. So folks that have greater than two millimeters of joint space tend to do pretty well and less than two millimeters, not so much. Uh, the surgeons that I work with will not do surgery on hips if they have less than two millimeters of joint space, which ends up being a big problem if you have a 40 or 50 year old that has severe hip pain, have arthritis, and they're too young to get hip replacement surgery, right? So that's actually one of the things that pops into my head when I see a younger person that I'm concerned that they have some sort of uh, hip pathology, labral pathology, I will send them to a doctor sooner rather than later, just because I want to make sure that we do get a surgery if it's needed, right? Before they get too much hip arthritis, too much joint uh, space reduction, and they won't have a good outcome from the surgery. And then they can only at that point get a hip replacement. And they're usually a little too young for that, right? So surgery is also not appropriate when folks have labrum intrasubstance degeneration, calcification or ossification. These things are often associated with osteoarthritis. If you have frayed or flap labral tears, so some labral tears just can't be repaired. We'll talk about that in a minute. And lastly, I went a little bit more in depth on folks who should get surgery uh, versus physical therapy or conservative treatment. In my last uh, show episode, uh, Evidence-Based Guide to Femoral Acid Tabular Impingement Syndrome, I'll leave a link in the show notes, so definitely check that out. So let's say you're a physical therapist and Monday morning, your first patient is going to be someone fresh out of femoral acid tabular impingement surgery. They had a labral repair with a cam reduction. That's going to be the most common surgery. Usually it's an anterior superior uh, labral tear that you're dealing with. What kind of stuff do you want to ask on that very first day, right? Uh, first and foremost, you want to ask the individual what surgery they had. Oftentimes, these folks have no idea what surgery they had. Uh, and to be honest, a lot of times these folks are fresh out of surgery. I tend to see these guys one to two days out of surgery. Uh, so yeah, things are a little bit foggy. Things happen pretty quickly. They're often on pain meds, right? So you have to just make sure that you're communicating with the doctor if you can. So I'll generally ask for a post-operative report to see what we're dealing with. Oftentimes you can't talk to the doctor. They're busy. Get it. You're starting physical therapy. You want to make sure that you're not doing things that are inappropriate. So you can always call up the doc and then talk to the MA and just ask for the post-op report. And then you know what you're dealing with. Uh, oftentimes you're going to get a protocol from the surgeon. If you don't, you can ask the MA for that as well. Right. And lastly, I always recommend that you try to establish a relationship with these doctors, uh, just because having that rapport is going to improve your patient outcomes. And there's a lot of information that you kind of need from a lot of these patients to make uh, informed decisions moving forward. Okay. The other things that are going to be important from a rehab perspective that we need to know about as a physical therapist is going to be the size of the tear. You can get an idea of how big the tear was by how many anchors they use for the repair. So if it's just one anchor, it might be a smaller repair, but there's multiple anchors. It's probably going to be a little bit bigger. You also probably want to know a little bit about tissue quality, and that's going to influence the surgical technique 
which is probably going to influence the potential strength of the repair. And also, as I noted previously, certain tears are going to repair better than others. So it's good to know from the surgeon, you know, was this an easy, very healthy hip joint that we're dealing with? Or was there a lot of pathology? Um, are you concerned that the labrum is not going to hold well, right? Because it's probably just going to influence how fast we push things like strength, range of motion, and everything else, right? That's important to know. The other piece that's really important is going to be the location of the repair. Like I said previously, the large majority of these repairs are going to be in the front top portion or anterior superior, right? And the reason why this is important because it affects the contraindications, okay? So first and foremost, if I flex the hip and internally rotate the hip, it brings the cam deformity into contact with the acetabulum, okay? And after you've had surgery, you have just repaired the labrum and you have shaved down that cam deformity. So if I go into hip flexion and internal rotation, I'm bringing those surgical surfaces close together, okay? A, that's not going to feel phenomenal, but you're probably going to be compressing the uh, freshly repaired labrum as well. So that's why you're going to see contraindications for those folks, okay? The other piece is that if you just had a repair to the front top portion of the hip, if I go into end range hip extension, I am now stretching that surgical repair, okay? So it makes sense that you don't want to range that hip into hip extension, you know, uh, initially, right? And the protocol will give you a little bit more information about what the surgeon is comfortable with, and I do recommend following that protocol, okay? Uh, I'll give you a little bit of information about how we maybe talk to the surgeon if you think that some of the information is inappropriate a little bit later, and sometimes it is. The other thing you want to know about is how much joint space was available in the hip prior to surgery. So I have someone that has very minimal joint space. I'm already thinking they have a bit more osteoarthritis. We have to be a little bit careful with our rehab following surgery. Maybe we're a little bit more conservative. The other piece that's very important to understand is whether or not there's some sort of microfracture procedure in order to restore some of the cartilage in the joint. Usually this cartilage damage is going to occur in the anterior superior part of the joint, along with the labral pathology. Think about the ball and the socket and the hip joint bumping up against itself over and over and over again. You can have some damage to that cartilage. If there's enough cartilage damage, they can do a microfracture procedure where they poke a bunch of holes in the bone, the bone bleeds, and that blood is going to turn into cartilage, which is hopefully going to extend the lifespan of the hip over the course of time, right? The big difference between a microfracture procedure and not is that you have to be non wave bearing for a longer period of time, right? And these are general um, recommendations. Make sure you speak to your surgeon to figure out what's okay. All right. I'm not going to say do this, listen to me. Don't listen to the surgeon. That's a bad idea. You have to listen to what the surgeon has to say, all right? Develop this plan together. But if you have a regular cam reduction labor repair, then generally speaking, around three to four weeks, you're going to be either non weight bearing or partial weight bearing. And then if it was a micro fracture procedure, you're probably gonna have to wait a little bit longer towards six weeks, just let that bone heal up a little bit, start to produce some of that cartilage. Okay. And if we don't know that prior to starting PT, we can mess things up, right? So we got to know these things. What else do you have to be on the lookout for after FAI surgery? Well, you need to be on the lookout for surgical red flags. Okay. So for one, one thing I always look for are signs of infection. Okay. And early on in the rehab process is usually a pretty big bandage on the front of the hip where those uh, portal holes were. So we have to be on the lookout for uh, erythema or redness, especially if it's streaking, localized pain. You're going to see pain, obviously, but pain out of proportion, right? That may be one of the reasons to refer back. Unexplained or persistent uh, pyroxemia or fever. If someone has a fever and there's no reason for them to have a fever after a surgery, it's a good reason to refer back to the doctor. Okay. It could be an infection in that area. Obviously there's any sort of discharge from the wound or pus. If you have wound dehiscence, which is basically the wound separating, uh, this is not a surgery where I'm super concerned about that, but it can happen. All right. And if you have any problems with wound healing, so basically if the wound is not healing in the appropriate time frames, usually the patient is having a couple of visits early on, usually the first 10 to 12 uh, days after surgery, even sooner for a lot of docs, um, the, the patient is going back and they will be able to talk to the doc. If things aren't healing well, you just want to make sure that you have that information. Okay. One thing I will do uh, early on after surgery is I will take off the bandage, look underneath just to make sure there are no signs of infection. I'm also educating the patient so they know what's going on. Uh, oftentimes, they are getting the edu education from the hospital. But keep in mind, 
these patients are often very groggy. They just had surgery. They're not listening to everything that people are telling them. It's all very confusing and it helps to, to hear it again from the physical therapist, right? The other thing you have to be on the lookout, excuse me, lookout for, unfortunately, is any sort of blood clot, right? So deep vein thrombosis. And this could be some sort of pain, swelling, redness. This stuff is already going to be there after surgery. So if it's out of proportion to what you normally see, that's a good reason to refer out. You may also see some dilated veins in the affected limb. If you're noticing the ankles getting really swollen, that's not a good sign. I refer right away. I left um, that link, that citation, citation number 11, if you want to see uh, good signs of DVT, so you can be on the lookout and refer back. Uh, this is a personal anecdote, but I treat a ton of hip scope patients, and I have seen um, two blood clots over the course of my career, right? Uh, one I did catch and send to the doc. Another one uh, I sent to the doc that did not have a clot. And the third, they figured out themselves and went back to the doctor. And luckily, everyone was okay in this process. But those are emergent situations need to be taken care of right away. Uh, as much as I'd like to think that they don't happen, they certainly do. So uh, if you are suspecting that there's a blood clot, definitely refer out immediately. Okay. So what kind of post-surgical restrictions or contraindications does a patient have after FAI surgery with labor repair and cam reduction? Okay. So these are restrictions based on antero superior labral tears. And this is going to be the large majority of labral tears within the hip. But just keep in mind, these will probably change up a little bit if it's going to be a tear in a different location. Okay. Generally speaking, these are all general recommendations. Okay. Don't take my recommendations blindly. Speak to the physician, see what the protocol says and follow that. Okay. That's going to be very, very important. Generally speaking, range of motion is going to be restricted for around three weeks, okay? So in terms of flexion, this is most commonly going to be restricted, and it's usually restricted somewhere around 90 degrees, okay? The reason being is if you go into hip flexion, you're going to compress the labrum and make some bony contact between the ball and socket, okay? Keep in mind, we just repaired the labrum, and we just shaved down the bone, right? Bone is sensitive. So if you take someone to a bunch of hip flexion early on, you can really aggravate the front of the hip. Okay. We'll talk about this later, but we really don't want to have that happen early in surgery. The other motion that's going to be limited is internal rotation range of motion. Okay. So cam morphology within the hip limits hip internal rotation because the ball will bump up against the socket when you go into hip internal rotation. Now they just removed that cam morphology. So for a lot of patients, they actually have increased range of motion after the surgery than before because they got rid of that bony block that was restricting the rotation range, all right? But here's the thing. If you go into hip internal rotation, you're starting to contact those freshly repaired joint surfaces, which is probably not a good idea early on. So you're going to see limitations in internal rotation, okay? You also see limitations in external rotation, usually around 30 degrees. An extension as well as abduction, right? I think it's a good idea not to go to end range in any particular motion, but the reason why these directions are limited is because when you go into external rotation and extension, a little bit with abduction, you are going to stretch the joint, okay? You're stretching the fresh surgical repair of the labrum. So early on, we don't want to stretch that too much. We want some scar to lay down. We want to have some healing occurring. So early on, you don't want to push these ranges, okay? And what I will say, and this is anecdotal, is that most of patients' range of motion comes back over the course of time. This is not a surgery where you have to be aggressive about getting that range back, okay? This is not a bank art repair in the shoulder, right? This tends to get better with time. This is not a total hip replacement. We don't have to go cranking on the hip joint. Usually things get better over the course of time if we don't make the area angry. And if anything else, you remove bone with this surgery. So in, in theory, you're actually increasing the, the range the hip has. Okay. And one of the biggest reasons why we don't push into end range motion is because we can, we can definitely have some increased inflammation within the hip joint. Now, I don't know that we have this figured out entirely, but suffice to say, you can very easily make the front part of the hip joint very, very mad. If you do too much too soon, and this goes from uh, a range of motion as well as a strength perspective, especially doing a lot of hip flexion strength, and we'll talk about some of the contraindications to this a little bit later, but I've had multiple surgeons tell me 
that if the hip joint gets too irritated, they may have to have some sort of debridement surgery to get rid of some of that irritated tissue over the course of time. What I will say is that if you don't uh, if follow this kind of precaution, you can get the hip um, excessively sore, which is going to limit your progress moving forward. Okay. So definitely want to make sure you don't push the range of motion too much early on. There's no real reason to do that. This range of motion will come back over the course of time if you're smart. Okay. The next restriction that you're going to come across is going to be a weight bearing restriction. Now, this is going to depend largely on the surgeon that you're dealing with, right? Um, the surgeons I work with usually like some sort of non weight bearing or toe touch weight bearing for the first three to four weeks, right? I've had some local surgeons that are okay with partial weight bearing from the very beginning, right after surgery. Uh, largely, it's going to depend on the surgeon. So make sure that you know what your surgeon wants before you go willy nilly with weight bearing status. All right. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you have a micro fracture procedure, it's going to slow things down. So generally speaking, for the first three or four weeks, surgeons are going to want some sort of partial weight bearing or non weight bearing for non micro fracture procedures. And then for the micro fracture procedures, you wait closer to six weeks. All right. Uh, but what I will say is that there's a lot of variance between surgeons. So just make sure that you know what you're dealing with, what the surgeon wants, so that when you refer the patient back and they go back to their, their follow up visits, the surgeon isn't really mad that you did something that they didn't want you to do. Right. That's not a good thing. Another restriction or contraindication that you'll see early on is sitting. And this is not something that you can't do, but you don't want to do too much sitting over the course of the day. That just compresses the front of the hip joint. It can lead to irritation. So usually you want to try to reduce the total amount of sitting that you're doing. Okay. And also not sit so that you're extending past 90 degrees. The next one that you have to be really cautious with early on is going to be hip flexion, active hip flexion. So trying to lift the leg yourself. Um, this again is surgeon preference, but oftentimes there's going to be a contraindication for how much motion uh, you can do into hip flexion as well as how much you can actively lift your own leg. Okay. So some docs don't want you to lift the leg at all yourself for the first four weeks. All right. Thought process is that maybe some of those hip flexors are tugging on the labral repair, causing some irritation in the front portion of the joint. Okay. And that can lead to some trouble over the course of time. Okay. Again, if we do too much hip flexion, that can cause irritation and that can uh, reduce our progress moving forward. It can also set us back. So we have to be really cautious with this. Okay. So just to recap a little bit, after you have that patient Monday morning who has FAI surgery, <clears throat> what kind of questions do we need to get answered so we can do a good job with our rehab? First one is, what was the surgery? Okay. Was this a labral debridement? Was this a labral repair? Was this a labral reconstruction? And we kind of cruise over this early on, but if you have labral damage that's too much to repair, you can reconstruct this a little bit, okay? So it's usually the surgeon's thought process. I've also heard a few surgeons say that if you reconstruct the labrum, it no longer has your own nociception, okay? It's just is a little less painful for patients although I don't have a research study to support this, right? So that's just what I've heard from surgeons and their thought process for choosing to debride, repair, or reconstruct, okay? And this is also going to influence your speed of progression. So if you have a debridement for very minor labral pathology, it's probably gonna be a little faster. If you had a debridement because they can't repair or reconstruct the area, then there's probably gonna be more damage within that hip and you have to be a little bit slower with your progression. Think about the difference between a meniscectomy and a meniscus repair. So if you repair the meniscus, we're much more restricted at the beginning of a rehab. Okay. So if you have a debridement, that's probably more similar to a meniscectomy. If you have a uh, reconstruction repair, that's going to be more similar to a meniscus repair. So we have to go a little more slowly. All right. Again, talk to the doctor, make sure that you're okay with your progressions over the course of time. We're probably gonna have a protocol. Okay. Second piece is make sure you know the accurate date of surgery because the, the protocol is only good if you know when the uh, surgery actually occurred. Okay. It's going to influence your progression of the course of time. It's good to know what type of surgery you're dealing with. Is this someone that had a cam reduction? Did they have a pincer reduction? Large majority of um, hip surgeries I see are going to be cam. I see very few pincers and every once in a while I see someone who has a labor repair that had no bony morphology, although that's uncommon. Okay. Also keep in mind, if someone had a cam reduction or they had a pincer reduction, bone is very rich in nociception. 
is a good chance they're going to be a bit more painful early on. Pain does a lot of things. It keeps us from being able to do our exercises, inhibits muscles. So just be aware of that, okay? If there's a lot of bony change, they had to really shave down that cam aggressively. If they had to reduce the alpha angle a lot, and that person might be a little bit more sore, painful. It might be a reason why they're progressing a little more slowly, which may be A-OK, all right? Next question to ask is, did you have a microfracture procedure, right? So if you had a microfracture procedure, we have to wait a little bit longer to weight bear, okay? Here's the other piece. If you have to wait for a longer period of time to weight bear, you're going to have more atrophy. So you just have to really make sure you're trying to maximize as much of the hypertrophy work early on without weight bearing, right? This is where I use a lot of BFR early on. I'm going to do a few case studies uh, after this presentation so you can see exactly how I would go through the rehab process in the early stages of rehab and also in the advanced stage of rehab. So stay tuned for that. And the last one is, what was the patient's tissue quality, right? And or hip joint quality, right? Are you dealing with a hip joint that had very serious pathology, complex tearing, uh, poor types of tears don't do well with surgical repair? Uh, did they have minimal joint space? They have a lot of, let's say, osteophytes. They have arthritis within the joint, right? Or are you dealing with someone who has a healthy young joint? Most of the folks I work with are young folks. So the surgery tends to go pretty well. Like I said previously, if there's a lot of osteoarthritis in the joint, Surgery is probably not go as well. And the other piece is that those folks tend not to be great surgical candidates. Most of the surgeons know that. So you probably won't see a lot of hips with advanced arthritis, right? You want to be on the lookout for red flags. All right. Are there any signs of infection? Are there any signs of DVT? These need to be immediately referred to the ER. Okay. Another thing to keep in mind, this doesn't necessarily influence your rehab, uh, but these patients are typically on some sort of medication like celecoxib. Cel excuse me, celecoxib, so bad with these medication names, as well as aspirin. And the idea is that you want to prevent extra bony growth after surgery and try to prevent some sort of DVT, okay? So we're trying to prevent that cam deformity from growing back, the pincer deformity from growing back. Unfortunately, that can happen. I've seen it in a few patients. So we're just trying to prevent this from occurring by giving medication, right? Last thing to keep in mind is these patients are often on pain meds right after surgery. And obviously that's going to influence rehab a little bit. So just make sure you're keeping it safe. You want to make sure you follow the surgical protocol. I would be extremely conservative until you get a surgical protocol to ensure you're not doing anything you shouldn't. And this is for medical legal reasons, right? You don't want to have, um, you don't want to do something that completely against what the surgeon wants. Then that risk is all going to follow on you. If there's any sort of medical complication in the future, you can get sued for that. It's not a great thing. All right. The other thing that uh, one great way to destroy your relationship with local surgeons is to do something they don't want you to do. Okay. A lot of surgeons are already very concerned with physical therapists. A lot of docs think that the physical therapist is going to ruin the surgery that they just worked very hard on. So if you start doing things that are a little bit early in the physician's mind, uh, they're going to stop referring patients to you, right? Which is obviously not a good thing. You rely on those patients uh, for your business, okay? Um, and if you do have questions or concerns about the protocol, just communicate with the doctor, okay? So one of the surgeons locally that I really like, on his protocol, it says we 12 start to introduce agility drills, right? Now, two pages down from the same exact protocol, it says we don't want you to start running until month five. Okay. So week 12 for agility drills is quite fast. And generally speaking, agility drills are going to be more stressful on the joint than slow, kind of like straight ahead running. Okay. So this makes no sense. So if you just talk to the doc and just let them know and say, Hey, I'm like a little concerned about this. I think it's a little early to introduce this at week 12. However, I'd like to introduce some impact and we speed up that running progression a little bit sooner. Oftentimes like, Oh yeah, no problem. I didn't realize my protocol said that. Okay. So the communication is really important. Unfortunately, sometimes it's hard to communicate with doctors. What I will say is that over the course of your career, continue working with the doctors that communicate well, because that's going to improve your patient outcomes. It's going to improve rapport. They're more likely to refer to you. And what does happen over the course of time is you get so many referrals from the docs you like and less and less referrals from the docs you don't like that your job gets a, a lot easier. Plus your outcomes improve, right? Because the docs that don't communicate typically aren't going to refer a ton of patients to you anyway, right? So if you don't have good rapport built with the surgeons you're working with, I recommend trying to build that trust a little bit before you go and, you know, tell the surgeon that the protocol stinks, right? What I do, what I found to be very useful is I actually go to the patient appointments. 
So let's say I have a patient that comes in two days after labor repair, you're doing physical therapy. I say, Hey, you know what? I'd like to talk to the doc. I have some questions. Can I join you in your next appointment, right? At your, you know, 10 day appointment, whatever it is, you go with the patient to their appointment. You're there one-on-one -on -one with the doctor and the patient. What that does is that the surgeon's like, wow, this physical therapist really cares about the patient, right? And the patient feels the same. They're really happy that you're there sharing with the process. Now, I know it's hard to do this as a busy professional, but I think at the end, it does reap the reward and you don't have to do it with all your patients, maybe with a couple, just to kind of get to know the surgeon a little bit better, build that rapport. And then what happens is they're more likely to refer patients back to you. So if you like working with hips, you want that business, that's a great business move as well. Okay. And lastly, you can always email and call the surgeon, right? Uh, sometimes you won't get the surgeon directly. You'll probably be able to contact the MA. And at the very least, you'll be able to get the post-op report as well as any protocol that the physician likes to use. And that's good enough to get started, all right? So if you don't have all your questions answered, you can get a lot of that answer just by talking to the MA, which is easy to contact them. They'll give you the post-op report. They'll give you the protocol if it exists, right? So continuing with our recap, what are some key points, right, during the early stages of rehab? So one, you want to be very weary of anterior hip pain as well as excessive soreness, right? So what does that mean? Because there's going to be soreness. There's going to be pain in the front of the hip. You just had a surgery there, right? So of course, they're going to be sore there. What I will say is that if the soreness gets to the point where it's extremely limiting in terms of range of motion, that's not a good sign. Okay. Unfortunately, you're not going to really know much about this until you see a bunch of these patients and get an idea for how fast they progress. And the other thing is there's tremendous variance between patients. Some patients they have no pain. The range of motion is perfect the entire time. Some patients have a ton of pain and you struggle to get them to do the easiest things, right? So keep that in mind. If you're starting to have reductions in range of motion or reductions in strength or tolerance to certain motions, then you're, you're starting to probably push a little too much. You probably have to pull back a little bit right? And it's not like if you overdo it, you just ruin the labral repair, although you certainly can if you go too aggressive, I'm sure, but it's going to slow your progress, right? And I think the idea of less is more uh, definitely comes to mind for these patients because generally speaking, that range of motion is going to come back over the course of time, right? Regardless of how much range of motion they do. So if you push too much, you may actually make it stiffer and limit the range of motion a little bit more. Also keep in mind that a lot of folks that get the surgery are young, fit, athletic folks. They have the athlete mentality. They think that more is better. They're going to probably want to push the envelope, but you have to tell them like, hey, don't push the envelope. You're actually setting yourself back. You know, this is a nuanced rehab approach. Okay. If we do too much, we get more sore. We get more limited. Our strength goes down. So make sure you follow the, pr the protocol as written by the PT and as a physical therapist. If you're starting to see these things, you're going to have to pull back a little bit. Okay. We're looking to avoid excessive motion, ER, IR, extension, flexion, as well as adduction, abduction. The idea is that too much range of motion will either compress the surgical site or it will stretch the surgical site, both of which we don't want much of early on. And last piece is that because you can't do much hip flexion, range of motion, and strengthening early on, these folks are, folks are going to be tremendously weak into hip flexion. And we know through some more research that folks with FAI are already weak into hip flexion, they get surgery, can't use their hip flexors for four weeks, they're going to be extremely, extremely weak there. So getting back that strength is going to be paramount. But if you push this too soon, you're going to get your patient super sore. Okay, so listen to the protocol, go very, very slow, make sure you have a good arsenal of exercise that go from super easy to super hard. I have a bunch of those on my YouTube if you want to check them out, link in the show notes, excuse me. So here's what I want you to do next, guys. I have made an evidence based cheat sheet, right? called the femoral acid tabular impingement syndrome evidence-based guide. And it goes over all the relevant anatomy for femoral acid tabular impingement syndrome. We talk about the mechanisms of injury. We talk about radiographic findings. So cam pincer, what they look like, what that means for your patients. We go over how to diagnose this injury. What's the best evidence-based way to diagnose femoral acid tabular impingement syndrome. We go over the best evidence-based treatments. Okay. And that goes from a physical therapy perspective as well as surgery, right? What are the outcomes for these things? We talk about long-term prognosis of folks with FAI and also the long-term prognosis of folks that go through with physical therapy as well as surgery. And we talk about the differences between outcomes in surgery and physical therapy. Okay. So again, it's a cheat sheet. It's got a ton of great information, super easy to consume, right? I'll put a link in the show notes. You guys can download this right away. It's a phenomenal resource.
I also want to give you guys some additional learning. So if you're looking to learn more about rehabilitation for hip scope surgery, I'm going to be doing two more case studies after this. So stay tuned. I'll go over those in a couple of weeks. All right. Uh, but some of the folks that I've learned a lot from over the course of time, uh, first guy is Mike Ryman at Duke University. He has a phenomenal hip course. I highly recommend you guys taking, but he also has a bunch of really good free YouTube videos online. Just search first name, last name, and hip. There's a couple of good ones out there. And if you follow him on social media, he's always putting out a great content out there for hips and, you know, physical therapy in general, but really like the guy, very down to earth, very friendly person, highly recommend the courses. The second person who works with a ton of hips is Mike Voigt. So he's out in Tennessee. He works with Dr. Uh, Bird, and he's done a bunch of research on the hip. So definitely search him out, read his research. Uh, he's also doing a course with Mike Reinald, who's my boss, and that's going to be out sometime, hopefully in the next year or so. I'm not sure when it's out, but um, definitely going to be a phenomenal resource. I've learned a ton from Mike. The other person I've learned a bunch from, uh, this is Dr. Mark Philippon. He's out in Vail. He's a hip surgeon. He's kind of like one of the OG surgeons for hip scopes in the United States, right? Uh, he has quite a bit of research on the hip, which is pretty cool. He kind of searched his name into PubMed. I also have a few references I'll have in the show notes um, about hip arthritis and surgical outcomes. He's a great person to follow. Uh, I also utilize a protocol that was developed by himself and the physical therapist out in Vail. And uh, a lot of the surgeons that I work with today actually trained out in Vail with Dr. Philippon. So I believe that uh, he's a good resource and his protocols are actually quite nice. So if you're looking to see what a protocol looks like, head on to Google, search for Philippon, uh, post-op hip, and see what you get. All right. Again, super important. You just, you're not, you know, going rogue and doing whatever you want with these uh, patients after surgery. You need to make sure you're communicating with the doctor and following their protocols. But if you want to see an example, that's a good one. Okay. I also have a guide to get out of hip pain and back in the gym. So if you're dealing with patients that have FAI, I have another really nice infographic you guys can, can take a look at to help get you back to squatting, sumo deadlifting, whatever was hurting your prior Olympic lifts. Okay. Link in the show notes. And then, like I said previously, I'm going to be going over a couple case studies. So one in the early stages uh, after uh, surgery and one of the later stages when people are thinking about returning back to sport. So you can see exactly how I'd like to do this. Okay. If you're interested in any of the references, I'll put them in the show notes as well. So click that link and check on some of those. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the references that I selected. You know, I know that's a hot topic nowadays, what research you read, you know, my cherry picking, you know, let me know in the comments. And lastly, thank you so much for your support. You truly allow me to do what I love for a living. Keep on watching. Hit that like button if you didn't. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this conversation today. So leave a comment, right? Agree or disagree. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. And it really helps me out a ton if you leave a positive rating and review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening to this podcast from. Thanks again. I'll see you on the next one.